The Universal Serial Bus is a very versatile input and output on your computer, streamer, printer and indeed digital to analog converter. But in its versatility lies also its weakness. Since it is not designed for quality audio standard USB often sounds less optimal. USB is introduced 27 years to date, which in ICT world makes it archaic, but luckily it is very frequently updated. Already two years after the introduction version 1.1 was introduced and again two years later version 2.0. Currently we are at version 4. With every version and subversion the speed was increased drastically. Luckily backwards compatibility within the USB standard will not make older equipment obsolete. Other factors outside of USB like drivers might though. There is a wide selection of connectors used but matching adapter cables solve eventual incompatibility. Each version of USB knows several modes and Universal Plug and Play UPnP for short, provides automatic switching to the right mode. To make it possible, every USB interface chip directly after the connector is switched on even if the device it is in is not powered. That chip is powered by the source device it is connected to over two cores in the USB cable. Together with operation systems that now automatically load the right driver, printers, scanners and other ancillary equipment more or less works automatically without user interference. Thus the same goes for audio. When the USB standard was extended to do audio in 1998, 96 kHz audio was still rare. But it fitted the 12 MHz USB 1 full speed standard, so that was set. It's an isogenous connection, meaning that the source sends a continuous stream of audio data to the receiving device and the receiving device has to follow the speed at which the audio data is sent. If the receiving device can't keep up, data will be lost. Not that this easily happens. More important is that timing irregularities in the sending device can cause jitter in the receiving device. And if the receiving device chases the incoming data stream, that can cause jitter too. Add to that the USB power line can shift the ground plane in the receiving device. It can also transport electronic noise to the receiving device. See my video Why Digital Circuits Influence the Sound Quality for more information. USB Audio Class 1 is always 2 channel with sampling rate up to 96 kHz with 24 bit depth. All operating systems on computers, tablets and smartphones support USB Audio Class 1, although Android devices need a so called OTG cable and iOS devices need a lightning to USB cable. Most modern decks both do class 1 next to class 2 while the older ones, say 5 to 7 years old, are limited to class 1. USB Audio Class 2 uses the USB 2 high speed mode, which is 480 MHz and is part of the USB 2 and 3 standard. It can transport as many channels at any sampling frequency and bit depth within the restraint of the available bandwidth on the USB bus. Since I only do two channel audio, I don't go deeper into this. For stereo it means that any sampling frequency and bit depth is supported. Another difference is that class 2 is asynchronous, meaning that there is no constant stream of audio bits but rather packets are sent until the receiving device signals the buffer is full. When the buffer is able to receive data again, it requests more data from the sending device. In the unlikely event a data packet arrives damaged, it can be sent again. More important is that the receiving device clocks the reading from its buffer meaning that the quality of the clock oscillators in the sending device have no influence on the timing in the receiving device. This is especially important if the receiving device is a DAC. 
Therefore, with class 2, the quality of the clock oscillator in the DAC largely defines the precision of the timing during the D2A conversion. Although still pollution over the USB power line and common mode noise from the sending device have their influence on timing too. As told before, the power line in the USB cable is potentially a source of pollution since it can and often will be a conduit for electronic noise and ground potential problems. Therefore there are people that cut open the USB cable mantle and cut the power line leaving the other cores intact. The plus 5 volts is on the red core if your cable is according to the standard. But it is good practice to check it with a multimeter. Disclaimer, you will do it at your own risk, I will not support it and don't accept responsibility for it. An alternative solution is to find a plug that blocks the power line. But if you do, your sending device, the computer, network bridge or streamer will only see the receiving device, usually the DAC, when it is switched on. Depending on the brand and type of sending device, you might need to identify or confirm the presence of the DAC over and over again. And that can be rather annoying. There are also versions of such a plug where you can connect an audio grade 5 volt power supply to it. It will block noise and ground plane problems when used with quality power supply that is, while still carry the 5 volts to identify the receiving device but it still doesn't ban common mode problems that travel through the data lines. A simple solution that might bring some improvement is the use of an AudioQuest jitterbug. That is a USB plug with a USB socket on the other side and in between them passive filters that reduce nasties coming from the sending device. It currently costs 69 euros including VAT and I heard it worked in a number of instances as I describe in my review from 2016. Links to the review at the usual places. AudioQuest is not the only supplier of this kind of filter but it's the only one I have tried. Another solution is to use a transformer based device that galvanically separates the data lines and cut the power line. Again an external 5 volt audiophile power supply can be connected. I reviewed the LDAC ADQ professional USB isolator that costs around 200 euros. Links at the usual places. Earlier this year, 2023, I reviewed the Holo Audio Titanic, an active USB processor, meaning that there is active electronics that not only filters but also reclocks and reshapes the signal. Unfortunately, a key component, a USB receiver chip, if I remember well, is no longer available and the Titanic therefore is no longer in production. Such a shame since it worked well and was priced at 137 euros including VAT. Kitsune Hi-Fi still offers some on their site at the time this video was produced. Link to my review at the usual places. The Ideon Audio 3R is a more or less comparable product. It is 360 euros with the advantage that it's still in production. I reviewed it in 2020, links at the usual places. The ISO Regen USB by Upton Audio is about the same and is my favourite since it is 175 US dollars, ex sales tax. In the case of active USB cleaners, an external high quality power supply can further improve the sound quality. If the quality of USB conditioners get higher, the name changes to digital to digital converters, abbreviated D D converters. The higher quality lies in the built in very low noise power supply, higher spec clock oscillators, larger circuits and a more rigid housing. The latter is important since clock oscillators are rather sensitive to both temperature and vibrations. I have reviewed the Singser Audio SU6 which was in my reference setups until the Magna Manu 
MK3 Farad music streamer took over that didn't need it. At 700 euros including VAT it did an amazing job cleaning up USB signals from computers. Instead of USB output there is an I2S, AES-EBU, SPDIF and TOSLINK output, which makes it an interface converter too. Next to it there is a clock output so the DAC can be slaved to it, provided it has a clock input of course. It is a clear step up from the earlier mentioned active devices. The Denaflips Gaia is another D slash D converter I reviewed. It was yet another step up in quality. Again it doesn't output USB but AES EBU, TOSLINK, I2S and SPDIF and offers separate clocking of the DAC2. The best solution in my opinion is to use a network bridge or streamer. A network bridge is a small device that is connected to a computer running bit perfect software like Logitech Media Server, Minim Server, J River Media Center or Divana, Rune or Equal. When music is played the audio files are sent bit perfect to the network bridge that outputs the signal over USB, SPDIF, TOSLINK, I2S or AES EBU to the DAC or amplifier with built in DAC. The server program in a computer is usually controlled by an app on a smartphone or tablet. Since the network bridge is tweaked for audio, the USB output is far better than that of a computer. Often, but not always, network bridges support several protocols like DLA, LMS Squeezebox, MPD, HQ Player, Apple AirPlay and Room Ready. And of course there are good network bridges, even better ones and those that belong to the best. I have two playlists with network bridges, one with bridges below 500 euros and one above. Links in the description below this video on YouTube. Alternatively you could use a network player. The difference between a network player and a network bridge is that the player controls what is played using internal software as where the bridge relies on a server program on the computer. The player can still play music that is stored on the computer but the music browser and player runs on the network player itself. You can alternatively copy your music on a USB drive and connect that to the player. This way the computer doesn't need to be switched on to play music. Some network players have internal storage for music or can have internal storage added. Today a smartphone or tablet can be used as remote control just as with bridges. And many network players have the DAC built in. Using the correct cable is also important. For a USB that is 90 to 100 ohms twisted pair. Shielding is important to further reduce electromagnetic noise being picked up by the cable. Any USB 2 cable will work but depending on the quality of the equipment used audio grade USB cables can sound clearly better. But those cables are also considerably more expensive. A low priced USB 2 cable costs around 5 euros. A low priced audio grade USB 2 cable will set you back 40 euros. Today you can buy such a cable online and return it if there is no improvement in sound quality. The cable does need some time to burn in so have your stereo play 24 7 with the M switch off when you don't want music. That way normally within a few days the cable is sufficiently burned in. Another thing that might improve the sound quality is to make sure the digital equipment is placed on a very solid place since vibrations in the digital equipment influence the clock crystals and that causes jitter. Computers are handy for storing and indexing music files. With the right bit perfect software it can also output the correct music bits without any loss. But electronic noise and ground potential that usually travels over the digital connection from a computer and cheap digital audio equipment by the way will influence the timing during the digital to analog conversion. As I described in my video why digital circuits influence the sound quality. It can drastically reduce the sound quality 
Loans will have less resolution and will not go as deep. Voices and brass can sound harsh and mean. Metal percussion instruments like triangle and glockenspiel will sound distorted. Sibilants, S sounds will sound distorted. Special information and focus will get lost and so on. Not all artifacts need to occur simultaneously, depending on the character of the jitter only some might influence the sound quality. Ultimately this is all curable, but only if all things are done correctly. And the best route is to start off with quality gear in the first place. Those who think that since bits are bits nothing can go wrong with digital audio simply have a poor stereo, a good stereo set up poorly or a poor performing auditory system. And I'm trying here to say it in a friendly way. Which brings me to the end of this video. As usual there will be a new video next Friday at 5 pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to my channel or follow me on the social media so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It not only gives you my reviews a week earlier, but also keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.